Um, so thank you so much for joining us today at the DOE Laboratory Facility of the Future workshop. My name is Susanna Howison, and I'm the Director of the Office of Strategic Planning and Interagency Coordination at the uh, DOE's Office of Science. And we're delighted to have you all here today. And I'd like to extend a special welcome to Congressman Bill Foster. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I spent the last year uh, prior to coming to DOE as a nuclear security fellow in his office. So he was kind enough to join us today. Um, and I will um, get started now that we have everyone in attendance. Um, so the first thing I'd like to do is provide a welcome from our director, Dr. Chris Fall. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Chris Fall and I'm the director of the Office of Science at the Department of Energy. I'm really excited that you all have joined us today for this, uh, well, it's an experiment of sorts, but it's a workshop. Uh, and before I go further, let me express up front my appreciation to our three fantastic panelists. Uh, I'd hope to be there virtually in person, join in person, because uh, I've really been looking forward to this for a long time. Unfortunately, I'm away on travel, so I'm just going to have to uh, be satisfied watching the recording. Anyway, this is a little bit of an experiment because it's the first public convening that we've had as part of our Laboratories of the Future effort. Uh, with Labs of the Future, uh, we're trying hard to free ourselves from the constraints of what is uh, and imagine uh, what could be. Right? Imagine uh, what we would put together if we didn't have a system of public science and decided one day to create one from scratch, if you will. Note that I didn't say government science uh, because we believe that science and technology in the public interest will continue uh, to move inexorably towards partnerships uh, with academia, with the private sector, with government, uh, and internationally. So as part of the labs of the future, we're thinking about partnerships. We're thinking a lot about policy, uh, a lot of questions there, thinking about people, uh, and we'll have uh, convenings, events, solicit input about those topics. And of course, um, as evidenced by this workshop today, we're thinking very hard about places. And that's why this workshop is so cool. Uh, I want to thank Susanna Howison, who leads the overall Labs of the Future uh, effort and obviously organized uh, this event today. But I also want to call out Ken Falar, one of the panelists, for planting the seeds for this workshop uh, about two years ago now. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious to most, most of us that architecture can be inspirational. Uh, you know, you can see Fermilab here behind me if you haven't been there, the iconic Wilson building. Uh, 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 you know, our, our architecture can be inspirational uh, and, and that most of us want to live and work in places that are comfortable and pleasing. Uh, but Ken painted for me a fantastic picture about the role of architecture in facilities, our scientific facilities, how the inclusion of architecture and thoughtful design from the concept stage uh, of an instrument or a facility rather than sort of uh, as a decorative add-on or the shell, if you will, how that can make a significant difference in the science uh, and, and, and how we do it. So anyway, I was sold. Uh, you'll see for yourselves that Ken is very persuasive and uh, I, think, I think it'll be an enjoyable session. I don't wanna take up any more time from the panelists. You're gonna hear about these concepts uh, and others today from Ken, from Sandra, from Bill, Thank each of you uh, uh, very much for contributing your time today to this Labs of the Future effort. And I, I do really wish I could be there in person. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fall. Um, and I just also wanted to note uh, that Congressman Foster worked at Fermilab, which you just saw on the screen for over 20 years. So he is very uh, interested and invested in our labs. And, so I just, um, as Dr. Fall said, we are, have embarked on this initiative called DOE Laboratories of the Future. Um, we are doing this because the labs are globally recognized to be masters of science of scale, masters of interdisciplinary research and designing, building and operating user facilities. Um, however, they're entering their eighth decade of existence. Their historical roots in the Manhattan Project and Cold War have left them with a certain posture that may need to be updated um, for them to continue to fully excel for the next 70 or so years. 
There's also a number of advances that are affecting the way we are performing science, uh, such as AI, machine learning, automation. And we want to make sure that the labs are fully taking advantage of these new opportunities. Lastly, while this was not the case when I began this project uh, six months ago, we are in the middle of a global pandemic, um, which has changed all of our lives and work. It has also, however, presented a number of unexpected opportunities in terms of forcing change much faster than any of us thought possible. We want to make sure that we are fully taking advantage of this, as well as doing the necessary planning and preparation if this is just the first of several or even many pandemics. So what are we doing? We are developing a vision for how the laboratories will operate in the future using stakeholder input and ideas from other successful models. I have personally talked to um, over 100 people at this point to gather ideas and um, I'm not done yet. So um, we are attempting to do this without being bound by current constraints, whether they're legal, political, social, economic, and, and we're doing this by asking the question, if you were to establish the lab system today, what would it be? Where would it be? What would the mission be? Where would it be located? How would it be organized? How would it work together as a network? You know, how would it interact with its local and regional economy? And then of course, the subject of today's workshop, what would the buildings be and look like? So these are just some of the ideas that I've gathered up until this point. Um, and when I am speaking about facilities, I'm using the broadest definition. So this includes both user facilities or large user facilities that you're all aware of, as well as our laboratory buildings and then office buildings and the campus as a whole. Um, so in a facility level, you know, people are interested in having facilities that are smart, automated, accessible remotely. The facilities could combine multiple disciplines and include space for external partners as well. They would like them to facilitate collaboration and team science and include options for remote collaboration as well. And this could be something like virtual reality so that you actually feel like you're in the same room with somebody. Um, and then lastly, the facilities would be modular, modular and adaptable in the sense that they could transform as science and technology needs change. Uh, at a campus level, um, people are interested in having the lab campuses be open as much as possible, having collaborative spaces either on campus or just outside the fence. They'd like services for the basic needs um, of the researchers, you know, this housing, dining, health and wellness, and dependent or child care. And they're also interested in having a campus that is vibrant and inspirational, which uh, Dr. Fall alluded to. And doing all of this while maintaining the highest levels of safety and security, both physical and cyber. So, before we attempt to uh, implement this very long list of lofty goals, um, I thought it would be helpful to um, have a workshop that took a step back and see what we could learn by looking at scientific architecture as a whole. Learning from past projects and current ones and viewing the entire landscape of scientific facilities. Um, We'd like to understand the answers to the questions such as what impact does the design of a building and campus have on the science done within? How can we be more intentional when designing facilities to maximize not just collaborations and R&D outputs, but the overall health and happiness of the researchers? What can we learn from subject matter experts that are in other fields that can improve how we design our facilities? I hope that these questions and more will be explored today by our, by our three fantastic panelists. We have with us today, Dr. Stuart Bill Leslie, who is a science and technology historian. We have Mr. Ken Pilar, who is a, an architect of large scientific facilities. And then we have Professor Sandra Caggio Grady, who's an architect philosopher who's um, surveyed contemporary laboratories across the globe. Uh, lastly, before I uh, introduce our first Speaker Bill, I just want to mention once again that given the size of our audience, we aren't going to be able to have people ask questions um, 
personally. So please, you can either email me um, if you have my email address, which I sent earlier, or you can just put your questions in the chat and we'll do a sweep. Um, I have questions prepared in case we have a quiet bunch, but I expect that the group will have lots of things that they'd like to know from our great speakers. Um, but we are gonna hold uh, all questions until the end and, and get started on our presentations. So with that, um, let me just do a quick introduction of Dr. Leslie. He teaches the history of science, technology, and medicine at Johns Hopkins University. He first became interested in architectural history while writing an article on the corporate campuses for GM, IBM, and Bell Labs, and has since written a number of articles on laboratory design, including pieces on IM Pei's National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Louis Kahn's Salk Institute, and the aerospace modernism in Southern California. And he is currently completing a new history of Johns Hopkins University. So with that, I will stop sharing and let him take over. There we go. Thank you very much, Susanna. And thank you for inviting me to attend this, this discussion, which is an honor for a historian, frankly. And let me say first that Laboratories, of course, measure their success by Nobel Prizes, not Pritzker Prizes, which are for architects. And it's also true that a number of the most distinguished, scientifically distinguished laboratories are among the least interesting architecturally. This is Bell Laboratories from 1941. Tremendous scientific work, uh, but not an intentionally beautiful building or even one that gave a great deal of thought to things beyond of the interaction of people at short distance, but it has its own infinite corridor. So in that sense, it's a little bit like MIT for any MIT grads. And this, of course, is Los Alamos from about 1950. Uh, it too, no one would say that that was a distinguished architectural place, but it certainly turned out some world-class science. So it's only rarely that you'll find laboratories that are both scientifically and architecturally distinguished. And I want to uh, introduce you to two of them today. One is a place, of course, any Brookhaven person will know because it's the old chemistry building uh, at Brookhaven, building 555 by Marcel Breuer. And the other one is by I.M. Pei. This is the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. And these are both buildings that really have stood the test of time, 50 years and counting. And I should point out, I'll leave you with a a little quote for a minute, that a signature building is a lot like a corporate headquarters. It's the kind of place that says, this is who we are, this is what we do, this is how we do it. And ideally, a good architecture brings that kind of place to life. It brings the organizational chart to life symbolically and pragmatically. It answers questions like, is the administration gonna be conspicuous or is it gonna be conspicuous uh, by its absence? Will the design encourage interdependence or independence? How are people going to circulate? Are they going to move vertically? Are they going to move horizontally? Are they going to meet in public spaces like cafeterias or plazas? Or, or are they going to meet in private spaces, a little enclave somewhere along the line? And how long is a building going to last? One of the things I always wonder about is what's the half-life of a laboratory? And maybe we can provide a couple of answers here. Now, I am Pei's building, um, the NCAR Center, is not one of his most famous, except to Woody Allen fans. And I couldn't resist his short clip from Sleeper, where it serves as a stand-in for a futuristic lab. Well, I get this. Do you love right now? Oh, I don't know. Um, I like that, that clip because, of course, it brings together the two things that NCAR is, is noted for, its architecture and its state-of-the-art computers. 
uh, Woody Allen, Never Fear, was no, no more than about five feet off the ground during, during the filming, but it's, a, it's certainly memorable. It was brand new at, at, at that time. Now, the person who commissioned this laboratory is on the left of your screen. That's Walter Roberts. I am Pei is on the right. And Roberts really had a sense of what he wanted NCARD to be. He wanted it to be a self-directed community of peers. It would not be a single laboratory in the usual sense, but it would be a, a place that would bring together observations from across the globe. They'd be put into models and then they would be linked by networks of computers. So it would be a kind of village green for the laboratory uh, he had in mind. He wanted a place that had complexity, communication, creativity, and that would be sustained by diversity and interdependence. And when he was talking about where the director's office should be, he said, there should be 20 ways to go from my office down to the chemistry laboratory. And for that, for that by that he meant all those opportunities for serendipitous um, collaboration that you might not think about. He had, in other words, a lot more confidence in grassroots community building than in a great architectural master plan. Now, Roberts appreciated the power of architecture, and as we saw from our, our lead-in, this is the same building, Wilson Hall at Fermi Lab, he appreciated that, you know, a great laboratory required a setting of environmental beauty, architectural grandeur, cultural splendor. Robert Wilson, who of course had a good hand in designing this, said if we produced a dowdy site with shabby buildings, then the technical people we wanted would not come and the statesmen who might judge us in, pipe, in part by appearances would not in the long run give us the funds we need to do our physics. So there's a symbolic role that's very important in laboratory design too. Now Roberts was only in his 40s when he began this collaboration with I.M. Pei and he really saw a laboratory that would be no larger than a few hundred people. He really did not want big science to crowd out small science. He was afraid that big projects characteristic of national labs wouldn't always have the answer for the toughest questions. He certainly knew where he wanted the laboratory to be. Here's a site visit from Aura, but he could actually see it from his front uh, porch. It was a, a mesa in Boulder uh, right next to his house, and he thought that he needed a building that would somehow express the dignity of the site but not compete with it. And you get a sense here from the scale of the building against the flat iron mountains behind it, that there's no way it could actually compete with the natural site. So it had to blend in one way or another. Now in preparing to find the right architect, he visited laboratories across the country, including national laboratories. And he wanted to find out what scientists really wanted. And of course, what he discovered is they wanted quiet private offices, they wanted to be close to their laboratories, they wanted a room with a view, they wanted natural light, they wanted working windows, all kinds of things that didn't work out very well in this building, but at least he knew what they wanted. But what seemed to be missing in all of the buildings that he visited was a soul. And he felt that if he couldn't find a real prototype for NCAR, at least he could find an architect who would be sympathetic to the kind of philosophy that he had in mind for it, a philosophy put into practice uh, by his, his deputy, Philip Thompson, about a place where you can be distracted by a different kind of beauty. So what he didn't want was a kind of architectural straitjacket. He wanted a place where you could change things around easily, where you could put something on the wall or tear a hole in it. He wanted a sense of, of incompleteness that he thought was essential to a good scientific environment. And of the architects on his final list, I am Pei, and we see the model here, gained Robert's confidence as somebody who could really deliver what it is that NCAR needed, that could give him a place to pace and the nooks and crannies where people could interact. His model was a kind of beehive where the administration would be somewhat separated from the scientists and the scientists separated from one another. And this was the plan. It was not finished in this way. The Southern building ran out of funding. So it's only this part that was, that was built. But Pei rose to the challenge. And in doing so, what he did was set up a series of these 
towers, clusters of towers interconnected by different parts of the building, but only on, on certain floors. So they'd be coupled about three areas, but in order to reach these, what he called crow's nests, these are up here, uh, you, had to, you were separated from not only the people below you, but from anyone around you. So the idea was to have a kind of almost monastic uh, seclusion. And even to get there was, was quite something. You have to go up, you can see here from profile that you would have a crow's nest here with some glass. And then in order to get to visit your colleagues, you'd have to go down several levels and across or, or through the basement. It seemed like a great idea, and in some ways it was. In some ways, I'll say it wasn't. To reach them, you would go up these little winding stairs in these crow's nest um, devices here, these little cylinders, and then you really have all the solitude that you could, you could possibly want. He even told Roberts that what they needed was something like the Alhambra, which he considered a great piece of architecture, so a fountain right in the middle of the, of the laboratory, which would be a kind of respite from your uh, laboratory work or your calculations. He also wanted to have a place where you could meet for lunch. So you could go out on this tree terrace and take a look at the uh, a landscape around you. So it, it looked to Roberts like the ideal kind of environment. One of the problems he saw though, was that he thought, you know, if this laboratory reaches more than 500 people, I'm gonna quit. He thought anything li larger than that was gonna be too bureaucratic for its own good. And so those were the ideas that set the limits to growth for him about how big it should be. Now in practice, how well did it work? Uh, some things worked very nicely. This is the lobby and they have string quartet concerts here and it was a great social space. Uh, other things didn't work out at all. Those, those crow's nests were nowhere you'd wanna be in a Colorado winter. And so the only people who would go there were postdocs because they were consigned to very cold places. Um, even the laboratory, the library, which he thought was kind of give and go place, uh, a, a meeting place, ended up being grab and go. And especially as electronic resources became available, it was sort of a, a useless space for them. What he did not anticipate, and I think this is a problem for any lab, is how the science itself was going to change it. When he was talking to architects, one of them said that calculating machines might need some room, but they will never replace the slide rule. That could not have been more wrong. And of course, this became a place where the Cray supercomputer became the main form of, of scientific work. Uh, and they had to rearrange the laboratory to make space for them and eventually had to move them off the mesa entirely because they were too expensive to power and, and cool and, and, and that sort of thing. So, um, they just couldn't keep pace with the changing uh, work of atmospheric science. So in the end, uh, the best view was actually in the basement rather than from those crow's nests. Uh, for better or worse, this is the, the completed laboratory. Robert's idea of working in small groups with a kind of wide open door on the world is so embedded in the laboratory that it's very difficult to see how you could really transform it, change it, add to it. It's a place that's really self-contained. It's a perfect symbol of what NCAR does, uh, but it's probably reached more than its half-life. Uh, Woody Allen once quipped that eternity is a really long time, especially near the end. The second laboratory, which I'll go through a little more quickly, is by this fellow, Marcel Breuer. It's the Brookhaven Chemistry Building, uh, same year as NCAR. This is what it looked like originally. It was housed, of course, on an old army base. And making virtue of necessity, the chemist said, well, it was a great space to, to work in close proximity. And you always run into somebody as you move down that hallway. Uh, but although the laboratory director considered them well housed, they knew much better than, than he did about that. So what they did was petitioned for a new laboratory that they would help, they as chemists would help design. And they went to Marcel Breuer, who sent out a, one of his assistants to look at the Brookhaven site to figure out, well, where should the laboratory be sited? And then what should it look like? Uh, that was the most important. How do chemists really interact with one another? And so he set up this diagram, which shows you different kinds of chemists analytical chemists, or geochemists, nuclear chemists, 
and how they work with each other and what kind of instrumentation they share or don't share so that they could build that into the design of the building itself. And they thought that putting a little money into the design up front would give them a better building than the physicists had uh, right adjoining them. And Breuer's design did that. It put the laboratories and the offices in close proximity. It arranged the, the people so they could talk to one another, and, but also have, have their own space when they needed it. It ran the chase lines and service between the laboratories, which is just a cheap way of doing what Louis Kahn did at the Salk Institute, uh, but on a, on a budget. And so they had all kinds of good ideas about or circulation flow of air and what the building should look like, and Breuer really delivered it. Uh, and they could, it was a building they could be proud of. There aren't too many national laboratories that have a lounge that looks like that, uh, with Breuer chairs and the Gucci um, um, carpets and, and, and uh, the, 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 the stairway. And so they did achieve at Brookhaven Chemistry Building a workable and also very handsome laboratory that served them very well uh, until today. It's interesting that the first Nobel Prize they won uh, was for somebody working in that building, but his actual work was done at the bottom of a mine in South Dakota. This is Ray Davis's um, solar neutrino experiment. So you don't need to have a, a fancy laboratory designed to win a Nobel Prize, especially if you're working on neutrinos 1400 feet uh, under the ground. But when the building opened in 1966, it was beloved by the chemists. It's certainly served them well over the years. They didn't anticipate everything. They didn't realize how important lasers would be, so they had to cover up laboratory windows and that sort of thing. Uh, but it's been a very serviceable building. It's been redone rather recently, and there's no reason to think it can't survive for a number of decades to come. And I wanted to leave you not with those two buildings, because they're kind of detached from what's around them, but rather the ecology of laboratories, which I think is just as important as the design of individual uh, buildings. This is the Aerospace Corporation in Southern California, but it would not be what it is unless it was neighboring what used to be the Space Technology Laboratory or, or TRW. It would be a different place if the Air Force Base was not across the street from it. Uh, and the same could be said of many of its neighbors in the Southern California aerospace industry. This is the North American Aviation Science Center stuck up in Thousand Oaks. It wouldn't have had nearly the impact that it has if it wasn't connected to the Autonetics Division, which is down in Anaheim, a huge complex of laboratories and manufacturing facilities. To give you a sense of scale, here's what it looks like in a kind of aerial view. And you don't have to look at the buildings. What you have to understand is all of that is going toward inertial guidance and control systems that Autonetics makes. And that, combined with the central lab, is what really made it work. Or if you look at another company, Hughes, which is also very successful scientifically, this is their research lab in Malibu. It's a gorgeous building. It looks out over the beach and into the mountains. Uh, it's got everything you would want in, in terms of design. It's got this lovely uh, entrance. It looks like a country club. It's got places to walk along and think deep thoughts but it wouldn't have mattered very much if it didn't have the rest of Hughes behind it uh, to collaborate with. A building like this, which looks, looks a lot more ordinary, is in Fullerton, uh, but without it, that research lab certainly wouldn't have had the same kind of impact that it had. In fact, the people in this place, called the people in the research lab, the Beach Boys, out of, out of sheer envy. What's ironic about this little story is that all three research laboratories survived. After the crash of Blue Sky California and all the demolition of all of those large scale um, factories and, and facilities down in Orange County, the three labs survived. And so like our engineer here in the, in the film Falling Down, they are like their DOE cousins, sort of survivors of the Cold War and they've had to search for, for new missions in a post-Cold War world uh, that does not always seem to appreciate their specialized brand of expertise. So I'll leave you with that and stop sharing. So last but certainly not least, we have 
uh, professor, Sandra Caggio Grady. She's an architectural educator, academic leader, and researcher with a PhD in philosophy and professional architectural qualifications and experience. She was the head of school at UTS and in September 2013 commenced as the head of school and dean of architecture at the University of Queensland. Her research is in the architectural humanities and seeks to understand the political and philosophical context for contemporary architecture. She has recently completed a project on the architectural expression of contemporary science and its ideologies in laboratory buildings. This research, Laboratory Lifestyles, the first of two major book outcomes from the study, examines the history, ambitions, and effects of the addition of gymnasia, cafes, and social spaces to scientific research campuses. The second book, Laboratory, Speaking of Science and Its Architecture, was published in 2019. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you for the invitation. Can you hear me and see my screen? Yes. Yeah, we're all good. Okay, great. So many of you would be familiar with the rhetoric around the new laboratory buildings. There's a lot of confidence expressed in architecture and what it can do for science. So for example, this quote from a scientist that places for discussion serve as a catalyst for scientific progress. Or in a recent <coughs> document, um, from Arup, The Future of Labs, 2018, that more communication in the context of laboratory work is the key to innovation. That somehow large light-filled spaces <clears throat> will create a positive working atmosphere and accelerate discovery. There's in fact not a lot of evidence that links a good well-stocked cafe and a light-filled open space with accelerated discovery or that a particular configuration of stairs will lead first to connect, connectivity, then to certain conversations, and then to discovery. And we've heard earlier, a lot of Nobel Prizes uh, are awarded to scientists working in desultory laboratory conditions. And it seems to us, and my study was undertaken with Dr. Uh, Professor Chris Smith at the University of Sydney, that this Optimism for architecture is perhaps misplaced or in the wrong place because what architecture is able to bring to the laboratory is not just the organisation of spaces that might uh, support socialisation. We recognise that architecture was playing a symbolic role and that for many scientific organisations, the importance of the uh, architectural expression was such that even the laboratory functionality might be compromised. This example is the Hillside campus at Cold Spring Harbour Laboratory, a beautiful site. And its most recent campus has labyrinthine uh, laboratories with very circuitous um, circulation, they're subterranean, and all of this is science, you know, practically compromised in a sense for the expression of a building that's meant to look like the old fishing village that the campus used to be. The picture is also used in branding and recruitment. So architecture is playing a number of symbolic roles and we were interested in what those symbolic roles were. Of course, architecture has always communicated the values of the organisations that it houses. If we think of a cathedral, for example, we can see that the plan is an expression of uh, the idea of not just the liturgy and ceremony, but the idea of uh, the crucifix, so it's a crucifix form plan. We see that the decorative facade, the very enriched facades of the cathedral is about uh, you know, the, the, the value of that building to society. We can see also that the stone is an expression of permanence. The loftiness is about looking to the, to the skies. So here there's, we can see in the cathedral that there are a number of ways in which architecture expresses the values and ideas and ideologies of that organisation. We can also see in the cathedral a great similarity between different cathedrals. So there's a certain cathedral type. But when we looked at contemporary laboratory buildings, we couldn't see any commonality. So these are diagrams of 10 or so laboratory buildings in Europe, Australia and North America. 
And the laboratories, the wet labs, we were looking at life science laboratories, the wet labs are coloured in blue here. And you can see that in each case, they're organised in entirely different ways. The Cold Spring Harbour Laboratory, the bottom of the laboratories are, are distributed quite sort of almost randomly. Um, at, other, at other sites, they're, they're arranged in a row or stacked. So, or arranged around a courtyard. There are many different ways in which laboratory buildings are being organised. The other thing that you'll note um, here is that the, uh, the, there's a great deal of space around the wet labs and increasingly so. So when we did the similar diagrams tracking through the history of labs, we could see that the proportion of the blue bit, the wet labs was getting smaller and smaller while all the theatrical spaces around it, the space for social engagement, for um, reaching out to the public, for administration, all of that was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. In many ways, we can compare the contemporary laboratory building, not so much to the cathedral, but to Makita power tools, where here is the, the battery, they all use the same battery, but you end up with a vast array of tools doing completely different things, whether it's mowing a lawn or a transistor radio or a heated jacket, all of these are using the same uh, rechargeable iron battery. And in a little, in a sense, the laboratory building seems quite like this. In each case, it's performing quite different things. But what are they performing? Why are they so different? We went through the labs and recognise four different themes which have really long histories in, in scientific thinking and thinking about what a scientist is as well as science, scientific practices. And those four different themes we identified as islands, transparency, metaphors of science and mirrors to scientists. So I'm going to begin with islands. The very first island laboratory is Tycho Brahe's Uraniborg Observatory in Denmark from the 16th century, literally an island. So Bra imagined a space for himself and his scientists that would be away from the distractions of everyday life. This was incredibly important for him. Even, even so, he still had aristocrats coming to visit him on, on his island, but he really wanted to be separate and undistracted. And this idea of the scientific community is almost monastic and, and very intense, but separated from everyday society is continued. Uh, we can see it in the South Institute for Biological Studies where there was the, the plaza is set up in such a way that when you're in there, you feel like you are away from the world and you're able to look out to the horizon and imagine a new future. And this particular image has been repeated over and over again in contemporary laboratory buildings. You can see it here in a, a laboratory in Barcelona where to replicate something of the plaza, they've put an auditorium with a, a rooftop that's got water on it. Actually, the rooftop leaked and the water isn't, wasn't there when we visited. But here it is with this idea of the horizon and the looking out, but also this, this kind of a community that's introverted and looking within. In fact, when we look at the exterior of the Barcelona Biomedical Research Park, that very same building, it resembles an island. Here it is though, in a very urban setting and surrounded by hospitals and a kind of ecosystem, which it is part of, of scientific research. But there it is right on the, one of the main beaches, but expressed in an almost fortress-like way. Again, Skolkova Institute of Science and Technology, a much more recent laboratory building, very symbolically presented as if it were an island or a kind of fortress village. Not necessarily around, Janelia Research Campus is likewise an island of science in a, a regional location, residential. The, the lakes serve to create a kind of reflection which from certain positions, you can feel as if you are, in fact, on an island when you're in the labs. Almost in direct contradiction to, to the idea of the, the laboratory as an island of, of research is a very persistent theme in contemporary laboratory buildings, which is transparency. 
And the idea here is that, that the public can see into the, into the buildings and will know and have confidence in science that what's going on in there is not like some kind of alchemist den or Frankenstein, you know, um, heads on the desk, none of that kind of stuff. There's this idea that if the, the laboratory is opened up to vision, that they, there will be confidence. And literally this idea of institutional transparency is translated into the idea of glass, of optical transparency. And it's in fact a, a kind of difficult um, leap to go from institutional transparency to optical transparency, especially since glass is usually reflective in the day. So often these labs are presented at night, they're photographed at night, as if they are these fully transparent um, buildings in which, in, although they're not in fact that transparent. Uh, the Blizzard building also has an outreach program so that um, high school kids come in and they can uh, stand and look down onto the labs which are subterranean. So while there is this idea of, of the transparency, you're getting a kind of aerial view, it's all a little strange. A lot of new labs are transparent within as well, so that when you walk into the foyers especially, you can see uh, scientists at work. And this idea is meant to, again, reassure uh, people that scientists can see each other, that there's no way for scientists to, to be off doing something which isn't under a kind of peer surveillance. Taking this to its apotheosis, Fabrikstrasse 22 on the Novartis campus of Basel, big pharma company. It's a building designed by David Chipperfield. And here, the glazed wall between the laboratory and the workup areas is disappeared, it's gone. Um, this is the sort of, you know, the absolute transparency of the lab. Um, the biocontainment is handled by air conditioning systems, but it has led to some kind of strange uh, introductions, such as the glazed meeting room, so cone of silence there. Transparency can also have some challenges for scientists. This is at the Salk Institute, where this poor uh, scientist is right in the path of all the architectural pilgrims going for the daily, daily uh, tour of the Salk Institute, and he clearly feels like he's in a zoo. The third theme is that of metaphor. So a lot of the laboratory buildings uh, we have seen have taken on diagrams or ideas from scientific research and literally blowing them up large, tried to represent them in some way in the building. So this is a, you know, it's, it's kind of the idea of analogy um, writ large. So the International Neuroscience Institute here is meant to resemble a brain and a cortex. At the Blizzard building, which we saw earlier, those uh, spaces in which students come to view the labs below are shaped like uh, cells, there's a viral cell and uh, some other cells. I don't recognise them. I'm not sure that they're particularly accurate. They're playful, but they are um, possibly not that accurate. Um, the science laboratories at Chinese University in Hong Kong have the periodic table in stained glass. And this one, which is a very subtle metaphor, Navara Biomed, the architects describe the building has been um, inspired by leaves and camels. This building is meant to have the silhouette of a camel. So sometimes the metaphors are quite subtle. Usually they're not. The fourth theme we saw is where buildings themselves are a kind of portrait or mirror of the science scientists that they're intended to house. This is the Craig Venture Institute in La Jolla. Um, Craig Venter is quite unusual in being able to establish his own scientific research institution in his lifetime and have it named after him. And um, it's you know, quite beautiful accommodation. It's in, in La Jolla overlooking uh, the ocean. Well, his office overlooks the ocean. His office is uh, this one here, actually this one here. No, that one on the top. Um, and the way his 
office bends around the corner means he's the only one who's actually able to see the sea. He obscures the view for everyone else in the plaza, which is pretty, pretty interesting. And of course, you probably know Venter's work. He's very much a scientist and a business person. He's had numerous uh, very, you know, startups and private companies and uh, it, you know, pictures himself very much as an entrepreneur and an adventurer. So the building in its interior really registers this part of his persona. This is his office and it has you know, part of his vintage motorbike collection in it. It has all his awards in it. It's even got a, a 3D scan of his brain is in a glass vitrine on the coffee table. So it's, it's very much about his place. Now, as I said, this is really unusual. Most scientists don't get to design a building that's all about themselves. But when we look at real estate, bio real estate, we see that the leased buildings for laboratories are very much targeted, not to individual scientists, but to particular scientific, scientist demographics. This, this, these are really interesting to look at because you can see here what uh, you know, perhaps kind of cliches, but certain market sectors, how, how the bio real estate industry perceives scientists in terms of market sectors, you know, as, as real estate is very good at doing. So the Alexandria Center for Life Science in New York has some, um, got a whole lot of incentives from New York City to develop three towers. And part of those incentives were to foster an ecosystem of different, different sizes of organisations so that there would be a um, pipeline of, of younger scientists moving into, into more senior roles as they develop their careers. So in the Alexandria Centre for Life Science, we see the foyer is very corporate. We have the, the classic DNA stair, which we see a lot of in um, life science buildings. And yet in the area that is the affordable, so-called affordable area for um, startups and a younger demographic of scientists, this is the Science Hotel meeting room. The aesthetic is, is very primary school, it's possibly too young in their, their idea of the demographic. And we've got the Connect Four on the table here, possibly the stylist put it in there, but it's very, very much about here is the younger demographic. How can we appeal to them? Uh, a probably better way of doing this can be seen in Harlem Biospace, also one of the recipients of New York City's um, incentives to develop a, a scientific research ecosystem. And here the furniture is all upcycled, local artists. It's very targeted as sort of hipster, hipster scientists. Possibly the best representative of that is Nina Tandon. She was one of the very first occupants of Harlem Biospace. They have six month uh, contracts, rental contracts, after which they're meant to leave the building because they're meant to be successful and, and go off into the world. So the very affordable startup spaces for young, um, young companies. When we look um, at Arit's future, future of Labs and we see the list of things that they're predicting are part of the future of the laboratory. All these, this first page is about performance, the performance of the building or technical performance. And there's nothing there that you would argue with because these are all in fact existing trends, uh, you know, possibly 10, 20 years old, even more, most of them. So flexibility and adaptability has been a principle since the mid-century laboratory. Uh, plug and play certainly was very much part of um, the Norman Foster building at Stanford. Automation increasingly, you know, so these are, these are really not so much the future, they are very much uh, present. When we see the future of labs list for uh, the kind of HR issues, again, these are very much what we saw out there. And I think the, the key part here is understanding the limits of architecture to achieve, say, scientific acceleration through collaboration, but also understanding the relationship between these spatial ambitions or organisational ambitions, the symbolism of the architecture, and then the management 
of, of staff. So the soft culture that is built up. And those three things have to line up. There's no point having collaborative spaces and spaces for engagement in a building that looks like a fortress or an island and that, that, that thwarts that idea of engagement with the public. There's also no point having spaces for collaboration if it's not backed up by a soft culture. So one of the things that we observed, for example, in, um, was a lot of emphasis on cafes and canteen and scientific dining. And yet when we compared European laboratories, laboratories with North American ones, what we saw in Europe was that the canteen was backed up by policy that um, not just encouraged that where there was basically a compulsory lunch hour. So in Germany and Switzerland, because of their traditions, there is a subsidized canteen. Everyone has lunch between 12 and two o'clock and the canteens are fully used and you know, people are there eating. But in North America, what we saw was the, there was a lot of discussion about cafes as spaces where people would meet and that'd, that'd be the kind of lifeline of the lab. But there was a discouragement to have long lunches. It was pretty much you go down, you get your, your sandwich and you're eating al desco, al fresco al desco. Um, so there, were, there, was, there, there really wasn't a culture there that would work with the spaces that were set up. So often there's a mismatch between the ambition and the stated kind of rhetoric around buildings and then how the organisation actually functions. So those things, lining the three things up, how you work as an organisation, what, what policies are put in place to enable the building ambitions to be realised, these are super important. But then also is the architectural expression, we can't lose sight of it. And in a document like this, The Future of Labs, there's very little said about architectural expression. So I hope some of my comments today that look at some of the different ways in which architecture is expressing ideas about scientific organisations are useful. Just returning to those four islands clearly uh, is limited if engagement with the public is one of the, one of the desired issues and further transparency. Transparency too needs to be dealt with with some understanding of the limits of optical glass, you know, that actually you can have all the glass you want, but people won't understand the science that's going on in there that really needs to be coupled with programs of outreach and explanation, which is, I mean, it has to go beyond the annual open day, which often is, is all that is going on. So getting, the, getting all those things to line up, understanding the complexity of symbolism is, is super important, making sure you've got a great architect. So that's all from me. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much. Share once again. All right, so I have um, some prepared questions um, and they're really, they're open to the group and then I expect some more questions will come in. And if you have any questions, please feel free to add them to the chat. So, uh, I, you know, I can't start a question and answer session without bringing up COVID <laughs> sort of requirement these days. Um, but really, I just love to hear from each of you how you know the ideas that you've presented are either impacted or or you know emphasized because of this new environment that we're living in. I'll take a stab at it um, because I'm sitting in a building by myself, an enormous academic building with one person in it. And in order to, to get in, I have to fill out a form that ensures that I'm not, well, I can't ensure I'm not asymptomatic, but, but it, it certainly has made traditional collaboration extremely difficult, even on our medical campus. And, and dealing with that, and it's not just COVID, it's also the, the 
who's allowed to be on campus and who isn't. So we can't get our graduate students back from other parts of the world. We're trying to collaborate that way, but it, it is like any pandemic it is disruptive, but it's not unique. You know, I went back to see, well, what happened in 1918 and 1919 with the so-called Spanish flu, and it was very similar, actually. Um, so I, I don't think it's a, a brand new thing. It's just that we have different ways of collaborating now than we had before. Can I um, add here? So I've, I've found some of the collaboration that is now possible say through Zoom as we're doing now, absolutely extraordinary. I mean, all this technology had been sitting there unused. So it's prompted many of us to, to leap into new ways of collaboration that we were hesitant to do otherwise. And for me teaching, it's also meant new ways of teaching. So instead of doing one or two hour lectures, I can do 10 minute, 15 minute conversations and and upload them for my students who really only can concentrate for 10 minutes at a time anyway. So that's, it's been, it's been extraordinary in what it's done for education. And I can imagine it might do extraordinary things for scientific research too. Um, but of course there, there are some limits, some of those, those uh, you know, more accidental uh, meetings that may happen through co-location uh, we'll, we'll have to find new ways, ways of happening. I might make some observations that I forgot to say in, in my talk was that one of the things that we noticed around the discussion of, of collaboration in workspaces in laboratories is that often the labs would, the laboratory buildings were designed in such a way that the scientists who were doing very close analytical work, the junior scientists would all be in open plan. And the senior scientists, the ones who could actually established interdisciplinary groups and set new agendas would all be in cellular offices because of the nature of how we as a society recognize success. So we would see a lot of senior scientists in enclosed offices and yet they were the people who really should be sitting at a single desk all day but you know together because they were the ones who were absolutely absolutely able to start new projects and those in open plan were the ones who really needed to be um, in a silent, you know, concentrated space. So there needs to be a, a, a more nuanced understanding of what collaboration means and making sure that collaborative workspaces are targeted at those people who need to collaborate and private spaces or quiet spaces are there for those who are doing quiet work. Well, I, if I can, I, I'd like to take that one step further in that um, I think everyone needs both. Um, Everyone needs, you know, heads down time with the kind of people, scientists I work with. They need like significant heads down time and, and yet they also benefit greatly from collaboration or seeing how other, um, just, um, and, and the problem I see with a lot of architecture, you know, especially, you know, the open concept floor plans is it's, it, it tends to be, uh, I see my internet connection is unstable. Um, um, it's, it's, it, I think it really fails when it's forced. It's forced on, as you, you say, Sandra, one class or another. Um, and there's, and really you only have one option, one mode all day long, unless you have to, you know, actively get up and move to a different kind of space. I think the, you know, um, the, the more successful solution is one that is, lets you sort of voluntarily, um, participate or um, focus, and I, I know, I know one, res one researcher I'm working with now, um, almost daily, he's working in a space where, um, he's working in a space where he told me that he, when he goes into work, he doesn't plan on any getting, uh, getting any work done. Of course, this was before COVID-19. Um, and basically he would get all his work done on weekends and uh, evenings. He had to work in that space but it was it was very open plan, very much like one of the images you showed, and it way too distracting. It wears headphones, but you just every time someone moves, I mean, it goes back to just our, you know, our nature of of um, you know our, our animal nature of of seeing threats. Um, you know, it, it 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 is really interesting. I think that these these work certainly office workspaces 
really should be designed with almost the, ver the visual, um, uh, how we visually perceive space um, in front of us, what is peripheral. And um, it's pretty amazing when you look at it in depth um, in terms of what degrees off of what you're looking at, you, um, you know, you, it, it turns out your peripheral vision is actually more sensitive to motion than what's straight in front of you, which makes sense when you think about it. Um, and so it, I think it's important to set up even just very localized space such that you can block out um, a lot of that movement that is just around you. And, and, and I, I've been looking for ways, and I think if you can successfully create open space, which lets you sort of voluntarily, um, uh, voluntarily uh, contribute <laughs> to, you know, to the open space by even just turning your chair. Um, versus being able to focus. Anyway. Thank you. Um, so this is um, about using architecture to support early careers. And, and I think this came up um, in both several of your talks in different ways. But um, does anyone want to talk a little bit more or how we can use scientific architecture to support our new and rising scientists? Yeah, so I think um, my comments about how uh, bio real estate target market sectors, you know, it, it, it's a little cynical from the um, real estate industry, but if for scientists, the different demographics, it's important to be able to recognize yourself in an organization, to, to be able to feel comfortable and see yourself as part of that organization. And if you are an entrepreneurial, you know, young woman in New York, like Nina Tandon, she would not have been able to recognize herself in the corporate space styling of some of those other buildings that I showed you. So there, there is something there about how one feels comfortable with, with what is being presented and, and feel like, yes, this is, this is a space for me. It has the, you know, the diversity of gender, race, of, of class, all those things need to be reflected in the architecture in such a way that a young group of diverse, diverse scientists can can see themselves at home in a space. I think I think lead, leaders of leaders of organizations set culture. And yeah. I, I spoke of Dennis White there, um, uh, the head of the MIT Plasma Science Infusion Center. He was also the um, head of the uh, um, Department of uh, Nuclear Science and Engineering. Um, when he came in, um, he he just breathed in this amazingly um, fresh culture, which uh, everyone felt valued, um, very collaborative, in a building that was not designed to um, foster that. And uh, uh, so even dis despite the architecture, I, I think it's much more, I guess, about the organization, how people, people feel about each other and and it comes from top down and then actually you you know people start to hire other people that have those same um, characteristics and I think that architecture can absolutely um, further enable and facilitate and not hinder that but I but I do think it's it's about um, the organizational leadership first and foremost I would add something about curriculum and the way in which architecture supports a curriculum. Uh, when, we when Hopkins decided that it needed a new kind of curriculum that would be genes to society rather than a traditional medical curriculum, it actually commissioned and built a new building that would divide students in different ways and would sort of walk them through the curriculum in a different way. And I, I think that's in important. It's, a new curriculum like that often demands new ways of thinking about space and interaction, et cetera, and it seems to have worked pretty well. So I think it starts probably at the graduate level, maybe even undergraduate level, and extends into, into the corporate world eventually. 
Well, quite a few questions have come through, so I'm just going to pause my share, see if I can see. Um, so, will we need personal offices, spaces in the lab of the future, or will we be able to work, occupy whatever desk or workstation we find? Certainly the corporate world tried that in the 1990s and many of those corporate headquarters were open plan and so on. it didn't actually work very well. The idea was you would sit down at whatever um, place you might happen to be and use that space and there'd be small meeting rooms, etc. But here's a case where COVID actually may, may matter because companies like Google or other high tech companies say, you know, we don't really need you here. You can go wherever you like. You're working on a computer anyway. I don't know why that wouldn't extend into, into scientific practice too. I, th I think we are, as Sandra said, becoming a lot more comfortable with distant collaboration than we've ever been before. And I think people really, um, I think people do better when they're in their comfort zone, let's say, than, than uh, nomads, I guess, you know, um, um, when we were looking at the one of the new buildings there there was a we weren't trying to we were trying to design it to a point but then allow um personalization to happen um that individuals could make that space feel like um a home um these weren't palatial offices um it was really a lot of open office planning but with enough definition i think that people could really um could, could um, you know, like I say, just make it their, personalize it, put themselves in their comfort zone all, every day. And I think that that's, I think that that helps. That makes you more productive, lowers your stress level. <laughs> mm. There's a lot of research that backs up um, the need to set up a territory and personalize a space in an office. But I, it's possibly a personal thing as well. So I think you know, some people are very comfortable working in a cafe all day because they, they need the noise and they need the, to feel that they're in a, in a kind of urban setting and they don't, they don't mind what table they're at when they go to that cafe. But I think a lot of people also, and there is research that shows that they also need to, to feel comfortable and that their stuff is there. I would add one thing that when we're talking about national laboratories and classified mm. research and compartmental mm. uh, knowledge, that's a very different thing than it is in a, in a corporation. Uh, mm. not that there aren't, aren't proprietary things, but, but national labs have a different set of challenges in, in that sense than I think corporate laboratories do. I think COVID-19 has really shown, I mean, there was a lot of common wisdom about what couldn't work and uh, after, after experiencing this all for half a year or whatever, now suddenly we realized it maybe does work to a degree. And, and of course, um, what, what does the National Lab of the future look like um, if we're, if we're, when we become so facile with meeting virtually? Um, Um, so I have another question. Um, this is about NCAR specifically, but I think any of you all uh, could answer it. Um, so at any given time, especially in the summer, a significant portion, upwards of one third of the scientists working there are visitors. In what ways should that affect design considerations for laboratories or campuses? Robertson Pay did such a wonderful job making NCAR appealing that non-scientist tourists visit regularly to see the architecture, to peruse displays on atmospheric science, and to use it as a base for hiking. Should that be a goal for laboratory facilities? Does that depend on the nature of the facility? And what new considerations does such science tourism introduce? On, on the matter of visitors, that was not 
It was, un, it was anticipated. The scale was not anticipated. But it, NCAR has never been self-contained. It always had visitors. It always had collaborations with other, with other places. The problem is the building's only designed for about 300 people, and they cram 600 in there in the summer. And so what might have been a really nice environment becomes an overcrowded one. They've had to move both the people and the computers out of the building to make space. So that, that's one of the, I, I don't think tourism there is quite what Sandra is describing with the, with sock. It's not peering in the window. <laughs> People come there more to hike, but, but the, the idea of what are the limits of a particular laboratory building, how many people can you cram in there and still do well? I think that's, that's a tough question. And Roberts was right to think that after 300 people, it was going to be overcrowded and it is. I think the question about visit, visitors and residential visitors is a particularly interesting one. So Cold Spring Harbour Laboratory, which I visited, has um, tours, but it also has a, a major summer program where lots and lots of interns and young scientists come and stay. So it's got dormitories, dormitories for them and traditionally had been a very much a residential campus for all the scientists. It's not so much now. Most of them are commuting from... Queens and that that side of New York, but that idea of the of the residential component and the summer camps is is really held onto by that organisation, because people have such fond memories of it. And I think this is where the the socialisation with scientists really takes place. So um, one of, one of the other speakers mentioned that scientists and engineers tend to be introverted. I don't know what stats there are on there and whether they really are, but the idea that you're going to socialise in a stairwell, uh, you know, spontaneously is maybe wishful thinking. But when you see scientists with a couple of beers over a barbecue, given a bit more time to socialise and to warm into it, that's when you actually get the socialisation. And that's where things like summer camps and residential visitors are so important because they are actually then... Um, you know, they make it possible for people to build up deeper friendships, not just a high on a stairwell. You had mentioned that in our discussion, Sandra, and I wondered if that's why uh, scientists love to go to conferences so much, because yeah, because they can drink. <laughs> they can actually <laughs> yeah. go to the bar. Um, I did have one scientist. Just... Sorry, I did have one scientist say to me, you know, you know, you always. Everyone always goes on about the cafe, but what we really need is a bar. <laughs> yeah, we, well, visiting, when, you know, when scientists are visiting um, and their collaboration, sometimes they're, they're coming for a very specific person, a, a, a reason uh, to get a certain amount of work done, to install, say, a diagnostic piece of equipment on a, on a device, um, you know, insert some new sensors, and um, you know that might last. Um, I think we're losing you, Ken. Maybe switch off your video. All right, well, we will come back and hear the answer to his question. Mm -hmm. or, um, so uh, another question is if we think about labs of the future, um, we will presumably include close links to academia. Um, I would be interested in thoughts on including teaching spaces in the architecture of the future. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be the architecture of the future, it's the architecture of the past. When the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center was put there, it, it's literally right on campus. And that's a very different thing than if it, it, it had been placed in some of the other locations that were proposed. And it was thanks to the Stanford physicists that it was put on the campus rather than off. And I think that makes a huge difference in terms of the regular interaction of the 
faculty, graduate students, visiting scientists, and permanent staff. That's a, a rare exception, though. A place like Brookhaven is not really that closely connected to Stony Brook University. One of my favorite laboratory buildings, the Translational Re Research Institute in Brisbane, a very beautiful building. Thankfully, it's local and I can see it. Is brings together two universities, a hospital, it's on a hospital campus, two universities and a medical research organization and some private medical research, as well as a, a pharma manufacturer. So all those partnerships all together in the one building with teaching spaces and it's super lively and very, very beautiful. So I think there's, there's a, real, a real fluidity there that should be encouraged. And one of the reasons that building is, is very beautiful is it had a, a generous philanthropist, an American philanthropist. Um, we've not talked about philanthropy, but I noticed in the chat, there's a conversation here about economics and, and people being concerned about uh, public buildings and, and how generously funded or not generously funded they are. Certainly, I've seen a real difference in quality between uh, private companies like Novartis that are investing in their architecture so that they can invest in their people and some other laboratory buildings which are much less generously funded. And there is, a, you know, the architecture is not just about having a good architect, you've got to have a good budget. So that budget question is, is one we haven't touched on, but it is really, really important. Well, along those lines, the, the full question there was that, unfortunately, my experience with DOE in the past 20 years has been that buildings are developed based on value engineering, and there's mm. very little attention being paid to architecture. Mm. Quote from the site office manager, your next building will be a rectangular box, not too many corners. Mm. How would you go about and communicate the value of architecture in terms of staff creativity, employee morale, mm. and I would add mm. recruitment as well, mm. uh, to an agency that is driven by cost savings and concerns about what taxpayers could see as a waste of money? Yeah, that's a really, really great question. And, you know, one of the things that's really striking is architecture is actually not very expensive compared with the cost of research and salaries for scientists. So buildings, laboratory buildings will pay them pay for themselves within 10 years easily. And the architectural component of it, you know, the bits, the bits that look nice um, are actually a very small proportion of the cost of construction for a laboratory building where so much of the, the construction cost is in services. You know, it's in, it's in the engineering, the services and the equipment. So actually it, you don't need to, proportionally pay that much more to end up with a good building. So there's, there's a, there's a, oh, I don't know. It's, it's, it seems not, not well served to cut costs in the design of a building when you're having to spend so much on the people and on the equipment and on the maintenance and the servicing, those things are much more expensive. I think but they, you know, yeah, I, I would really stress the recruiting angle. Fermi Lab, Robert Wilson was very concerned. You're, you're out in the middle of the prairie. You need something visible for, a vis as he points out, you know, the people who fund you and Congress comes around, they want something to see. Uh, but when people are coming to be recruited, do you want to work there or you want to work somewhere else? And that was the same in Boulder, where you really, there wasn't very much there. There was a National Bureau of Standards and a university, but What's going to lure you there? And the architecture is it important. It's a kind of signature. And if you look at the business cards for places like um, NCAR or Salk Institute, the architecture is literally on the business card. It's mm. a measure of who you are and, and where you work. Um, are there any recommendations on architecture and organizing people when they're physically spread beyond one single building? As you know, many of the GOE lab campuses are truly campuses and, and cover acres of mm. land. Um, so aside from technology, video conferencing, et cetera, how can you uh, connect the campuses better? Is this visual consistency, walkways? Are there other methods for doing this? 
I think it's events. I think it's, it's got to be in the, in the programming, the organisational programming yeah. to bring people from one building to another. Like on any campus, you have to think about the arrangement of the different buildings across it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you looked at Brookhaven, that chemistry building I showed was actually next to the physics building. And that wasn't by accident, that was by design. And when they built the interdisciplinary center for nanotechnology, then you think about, well, who's gonna be moving there? It, it's just like a campus architecture. You, you decide which quads are going where and, and who's likely to be mixing with whom. On the other hand, you want some, some unexpected uh, interaction too. But I, I think it's just like designing any other campus. You want to think about who's working with whom on what, where. Um, so we've heard some very important features of buildings that employees, including DOE employees, value and that architects are trying to incorporate in the buildings that they design these days. I haven't heard much at this workshop about energy efficiency or other green features. How important in general are green features to clients who are having buildings constructed these days? In particular, shouldn't energy saving features be a pretty high priority of any new buildings that the Department of energy has constructed. Absolutely. And I'm sorry that I didn't mention it, but some of the projects that I showed were uh, lead star rated and it's a really big area um, for, for most organisations, not just Department of Energy. Obviously, it's particularly important um, for your organisation, but Everywhere, every, every organisation, private, public, needs to make a commitment to this and to express it. The Craig Venter building um, is one of the very first, I mean, their, their, their ambition was to be carbon neutral and you know, right from the, even in the construction, the, the mix of the cement, for example, was the most environmental, uh, environmentally friendly concrete that they could arrive at. They've got you know P solar panels everywhere, and it's a big part of their of how they present that that building and that organisation. But I would say it's not just new buildings. That is, when you're yeah. retrofitting old buildings, that can be actually very very greener than building the new ones. So I think yeah. some thought has to be given about what what how how you can extend the life of that building. Uh, by careful retrofitting and updating. Um, national security requires fences and secure access space. How can architecture help support adaptability or fluidity of fences in these spaces? It's mm. a good question. So the Nevada's campus manages its security issues by having a single gate, very beautiful gate building, gateway building that you sign in. There's about 7,000 people there every day on that campus. And then having a, a single boundary is able to have absolute fluidity um, what, within its campus. So I think that the ones where I've seen difficulties with security, for example, was a, a building for several organisations that are on different floors. And because they had different funding lines, they ended up with security between each floor. And so the collaboration that was envisaged between our different cancer researchers um, just didn't happen because people couldn't move from one floor to another. So I, th I think there needs to be really clear thinking about what the security is doing and what is being securitized. So you know, the, the security that I saw in this particular building, which I won't name, was, was right down to the level of they had different stocks arriving. So you know, they each had their own toilet paper, their own test tubes, their own everything. And so they were protecting their, their property you know, more than the ideas. And it was meant to be about collaboration between adult cancer researchers and cancer researchers doing childhood cancers, you know, complete disaster. So that, that clarity of security lines needs to, needs to be thought through in terms of, you know, actually what, what, what are you securing against? 
a lot of the security in aerospace companies, for example, is done internally through SCIFs. So when you're working on something, you go into the SCIF and, and you do that discussion, and then you go back. It's amazing to me how often uh, highly classified buildings are transparent in the sense that mm. they appear to be transparent, even though they're completely opaque. Uh, mm. and, and that's done partly by compartmentalizing things within them and partly by some, some pretty interesting technology to prevent people from reading vibrations off the glass on the windows and things like that. Mm -hmm. A lot of hidden security that you don't recognize that you walk around with somebody who designed it. Um, do you, from a location standpoint, how important are neighborhoods uh, versus just a mix of facilities when we're thinking about collaboration? Is the question around neighborhoods between scientists or, or the broader neighborhood? If it's the broader neighborhood, I think we've seen, we've got some very successful um, organizations which are in very urban settings and they're, you know, the scientists are mixing with each other, but also going out into the community and having a cafe somewhere else. So if we're really encouraging true interdisciplinarity, you want to have what scientists had in the 18th and 19th century in urban centers where they were mixing with, they were all gentlemen, but you know, other amateur uh, scientists and scholars and philosophers and, you know, playwrights, whatever, there was a much bit, much more intermixing across a much wider disciplines. We talk about interdisciplinarity and it's like, of oh, physicists and chemists, but actually, you know, chemists might benefit from meeting an artist. And I know that there, there are programs where there are, you know, artists in residence in scientific organizations, but that really mixing with neighborhoods, super important. I would only offer the caution yeah. that if you look at some of these aerospace suburbs, or even if you looked at Amazon and Seattle, it's fine to have a lot of gentlemen, but the gentrification pushes out a lot of people who used to be there, including the artists. And so Silicon Valley is filled with, with um, a kind of homogeneous population and unaffordable for, for everybody else. Interesting. Um, Ken, you're back. Do you want to finish your thought? <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. I, <clears throat> that was that was distressing. Um, but I uh, I've been thinking about something someone else said. I can't remember what I, what I was talking about, but it it was about um, I think it was Sandra actually talking about uh, wishful thinking. You know how scientists are going to going to work. Or, you know, we imagine our uh, scientists want a certain kind of thing or they feel a certain way about like that. I think that shows up when, when uh, in that very interesting um, uh, description of all those met, uh, metaphors or analogies that, that like literally show up in the shape of the building, that somehow scientists would like really like that or whatever. But there's a lot of projection, I think, that architects do because we're on the outside. And we, we have to kind of imagine how they live and work and what they would like. And I think that that has been, for the first time in my career, working at the Plasma Science Infusion Center and spending so much time there and being on the inside, really, essentially, as, as a scientist, um, um, it, it, it completely gives you a new insight into what works and what doesn't work and how you know, how um, people, um, and, and well, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a luxury I've never had before. And I think if there's a way that architects could somehow, if this could be replicated somehow, if you've got an architect on a project and somehow they can just, you know, spend some time there, day in life, um, mm. and, and let them experience it along with the people they're designing for, I think you'll get very different buildings as a result, as, mm -hmm. as opposed to some of these things that really get sort of imposed on, mm -hmm. on the scientists because it, it feels, you know, it feels like what they should be doing. It feels like it's the future. It's a trend. It's whatever. I'm sure a lot of people in this call have been, had a lot of things foisted on them um, that, that, you know, maybe they're not too excited about. 
and architects obviously you know honestly should take a bad rap for that it is it is awfully um i think uh what's the word it's, uh, uh, you know ego it's pre um a presumptuous <laughs> that we know how they should live how they should work what would make for better science etc um yeah I loved your description, Ken, of, of what you're doing and what an architect can actually bring to a laboratory design project as someone thinking through with the scientists how, how to go about it. It's a much more, much more interesting role for the architect than them combing through books and getting a picture of, cro of chromosomes and wallpapering a building with it, which just seems such a trivial response to, to really what's so interesting subject matter. Yeah, I don't know how to exactly, I've had people ask me how can the, can, how easily can it be replicated? You know, how many mm. people have um, the passion that I have for the mm. particular um, science I'm working mm. on, you know, with the particular group I'm working with. Um, to any degree that architects, I think, can, can really um, engage more in what's happening with the building, uh, there is a distinction. I mean, if you're looking at, there's, there's a big disti distinction between sort of life science and physical science mm -hmm. projects. The DOE has a lot more physical science in it. Um, and it's a lot more sort of instrument based than, you know, life science, which is probably two thirds of, of all the, the laboratories that get built. Um, you know, it's, it's much more modular. It's much more kitchen-like and it's, um, mm. um, there is maybe more of a of a kind of trend, you know. I think that there is much more of a. I want to say the building, the building maybe doesn't need to do exactly as much other than provide those little kitchens. You know, yes, we've got a lot more automation, and yes, you know, the laboratory is really shrinking. Um, there's much more computers leverage happening. It's, it's more offices and computers. Um, but we're talking to a DOE audience here and physical science is really a big part of that. And it's, it's more big instruments. There's more characterization. There's, um, and that's, I think, where the building really can um, just become as like the, this quote. I mean, literally, it fell out of the sky yesterday. I was talking to the CEO. And he literally just said that quote about how this isn't this isn't a building with a machine in it. The whole thing is a machine, mm. and and we were talking about what the next steps and uh, of, of our process here, and how we should approach it. Um, um, the fear is that it's so shrink wrapped and and integrated that it starts to become cumbersome. That every time you want to change your science, you have to like change the building, you know, you don't want that. Um, but on the other hand, um, what, we're, what we're doing there is a building that is, um, yeah, I think really leveraging. There's less burden actually on the systems themselves because they're not having to sort of, do, you know, other than keeping the, <laughs> the rain out, I mean, they could be putting these things in a big field, which sort of goes back to the original Fermi, Fermi lab concept, I guess. Um, uh, before they got the night before they could afford the nice buildings um but uh yeah i it's 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 interesting to think about how some of the things that i've gone through can be replicated and how we can how we can re have outreach to architects to to get them more interested and engaged and um, i'm not sure i'm not sure what the actual answer is i, I was interested in yes these these uh, DOE facilities are legacies of the Cold War, but they're legacies of World War II also. And would you have ever put a laboratory in Los Alamos or in Oak Ridge or some other place if you were designing it from scratch? And the answer is almost certainly no. You put them there for, for reasons of security and secrecy. And, and so you, you face a real challenge of where are you going to build, are you going to keep those centers? Are you going to to rethink them entirely. It doesn't really make sense to me to have a, a, a lab that much in the middle of nowhere. Uh, maybe for weapons testing, but not for anything else. 
Yeah, but you you have both things, right, Susanna? Correct. I mean, if, like like that's what happened at Lawrence National Lab, right? It bifurcated, you know, because it was like right, right on the campus doorstep of Berkeley, um, which was fabulous, but it was a security nightmare, right? So they had to create Lawrence Livermore. Um, I know you've been talking about that, Susanna, in terms of what the openness, right? You you felt like Op the openness of these campuses should be maybe a big part of rethinking what the national labs should be um, going forward. As, 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 you know, Bill, you're saying, yeah, there's a lot of legacy, right, um, about this. But if you if you could do what Chris was saying and and not, uh, I wrote it down, but I guess not not worry so much about where we are, but where we want to be. Um, you know, what what kind of openness would you have? Um, so I just want to get to a few more questions um, before we have to close, but how can architecture influence or highlight some of DOE's major capital investments, such as supercomputers in the buildings that house them? I know that I've seen supercomputers once you're inside, you know, they make an effort to kind of uh, make them look nice and they add graphics, but is there anything you can do to the outside of the building to uh, to really showcase them? Well, something I, uh, I something that I uh, put forward um, on on some of my recent projects was there. There's a bowling alley. There was a bowling alley. Unfortunately, got told torn down in Marin County. And I remember driving along the highway and stopping because I was stunned. It, it, um, it was done by an architect that was obviously a disciple of, of Frank Lloyd Wright, not, not far from the Marin, um, Marin uh, Civic Center there, which is a Frank Lloyd Wright building. And it, it embodied this um, really beautiful composition of spaces. There was the bowling alley, which was this big vanilla box that um, it, it was the lanes, obviously, and it was the bulk of the volume, and it was a tiny amount of the cost, and it was the backdrop, background building at which as you got, you know, the scale went down further and further. You got to the little jewel that was the bar that we've all seen at those at bowling alleys, you know, this little glass thing in the entry. As it, it broke down, and what I really learned from that was that I don't think you should take your your um, resources, your, your building cost resources and slather them across every square foot of um, envelope that you've got on your site. And so I think you wanna really kind of think carefully about whether or not the super, supercomputer building itself needs like all four surfaces um, really need the same amount of attention as what you're trying to build as you sort of, you know, get clusters of things that relate to those pieces, whether it's just the front or whether it's the building. Actually, was it you, Bill, that, that showed the Aerospace Corporation? I did work at Aerospace Corporation. So that's the, that's the library that sits there, that beautiful little piece in the middle. Um, you know, a lot of attention on that. And then the buildings around it are more modest, you know, but the focus is on that one building. So I think, I think when you look at the buildings on a campus, there is a hierarchy in terms of where you wanna, like you build your focus and also build and use your resources, you know, your dollars wisely in terms of architecture. I think there's a, there's a question here about whether you want to emphasize what you have or what you achieve. And having, having the supercomputer is one thing and yes, you know, they're big and, and, and impressive by scale, but uh, you maybe it's better off emphasizing what you want to achieve. What are what are what are the what are the findings? What are what are the transformations that are taking place through the DOE and emphasize those architecturally, rather than the you know the the having of the equipment. Because at the end of the day, a supercomputer is a it's a big it's piece of big equipment. Box. Yeah, it's yeah. just a big box. It's, well, the supercomputer itself is a big piece of equipment, right? Oh. It's not really 
I mean, the science is the gray matter that's inputting yeah. to that thing, right? And um, I mean, experiment computers almost like chilled water these days, you know? <laughs> it might be worth taking a look at what IBM did in the 1960s when it, in fact, tried, hired architects and designers to do a kind of overall branding of their, of their computer work. Mm. And you can see it from France to Northern California. And I don't know that DOE has that kind of budget to do that, but that was an attempt to mm. say, we are a computer company and wherever you look, you'll know it's us. My, uh, um, John Bush is on this call. You'll remember um, we were started a project in Portugal and the client there, the head scientist, we just met him first day. And the head scientist had worked in, I think it was IBM's Yorktown Heights. Uh, you probably know the building, Bill. Um, it's set in the woods at the corners of the, the corners of the labs and offices. They had these just, it was, they just, you know, took advantage of the nature. The whole thing was set in the woods. And uh, he said it was so inspiring. Um, and I, so I asked him, what, what, what did he want this project to be? So there was only one, we only had one chance to, to, to start the project. And so I asked him, what did he want this project to be? And he just, without hesitating, said, a beautiful place for thinking. And then he told me about that experience in IBM in New York and what, what it made people feel like, um, your ability to like, contemplate. Um, and it, it actually set the whole, um, for that particular project I worked on, it, it cast um, everything about how we thought about that, that project. And it was honestly, it was the most poetic thing I'd ever heard from any client ever. It was very inspiring, a beautiful place for thinking. We wrote it down, we put it on the wall. That was how we started every meeting. <laughs> um, all right, I think we have time for one more. Uh, what might be an architect's view of harmonizing design concepts principles discussed today with the space utilization goal of say 180 square foot per occupant. Tough one. <laughs> this is this is the economics question again. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I, I'm not sure how to how to elaborate that, and I you know I worry that when when you look at the history of say open plan in offices. It comes from two things. One is, you know, the kind of early Taylorism of, of work, uh, the, you know, which, which came with a surveillance, you know, a surveillance of people on the floor, on the factory floor, which is then trans, translated into office work. And, it's, and then the other direction is an economic one because, of course, people in open plan use less area than people in cellular offices. And now we have all the rhetoric about open plan as collaboration and socialisation, but I worry that it's a, it's a cover for just making cheaper and cheaper buildings. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure that I can... I can I'm not sure that, it, that the architects in, in always harmonising these things are actually serving us well as employees. You know, you harmonise it, you might actually be concealing, concealing what's really going on. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't, I think the jury's still out. I'm, I'm, mm. I'm suspicious of the activity based, activity based workplace concept where you hunt around, um, you forage for sp space, the right kind of space you need at the right time. Uh, every, um, and uh, in order to, in order to, and everyone is basically hoteling all day long in different mm -hmm. kinds of space for the different kinds of activities you need um, at the moment. Uh, it, it doesn't really seem to, um, I don't think it's very conducive for a, a fair amount of scientists who have to work on really sometimes long, hard problems. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they may be working at, yeah, and and having to sort of forage for space is, um, um, doesn't seem right, I guess. I can give you a quick example from our campus where the public health school said you have to have 200 square feet per occupant to be COVID compliant. And many of our labs are about 189 square feet per person. So it was a disastrous decision. No one knew that. 
50 years ago. But you never know when you're going to need the space, I guess. Well, hopefully, we'll come back to normal someday. <laughs> Um, so just want to be mindful of your time. Do you all just, uh, anyone have a final thought they'd like to share? My, my final thought is as scientists, clientists, be as engaged with the architect as you can. Make sure they're listening, make sure you're talking and just be involved. And for bring them in early. <laughs> you know, the earlier you can bring them in, um, the more the more options you've got. Um, that, I mean, that goes for um, that goes for any part of the science, really. The, the sooner you the sooner you talk, the the sooner you can adapt. It's always very sad to see you know be, being brought in and the doors are the options are already mm. gone in certain ways. Um, yeah. I would only offer the, the reminder that uh, Moshe Safdi had um, about Fermi Lab, and he said, well, if you're, if you're a scientist and you, you become your own architect, you have a fool for a client. And I, I think there has to be some recognition on both sides that, that uh, you've got a lot to learn from the other. It actually is a true partnership when it works well. Mm. Well, on behalf of all of our participants, I just want to thank you all so much for, for coming and sharing your insights with us. This was just a real treat to hear from um, external experts and, and I think we'll serve us well as we go forward and try and, uh, and uh, dig into each of these topics that go into the facilities. Thanks, and, thank you. And I'm getting a lot of thank yous from in the chat. Yeah. So everyone else really enjoyed this as well. So thank you. Thanks. Great.